Normandie. The Normandie. The Normandie. The Normandie 60 million dollar luxury liner comes to America on its maiden crossing of the Atlantic, an event that occasioned a marine demonstration that will live in history. By the early 1920s, the world economy was rebounding from the devastation of World War I, and passengers were returning to ocean travel. Shipping companies were thriving, but the feverish one-upsmanship of the pre-war era was slow to resume. This period also saw a major change to the business models shipping lines had relied on for decades. In 1921, new immigration laws greatly limited the number of European immigrants allowed to enter the United States. Steerage passengers, once the backbone of the industry, were reduced to just a trickle overnight. But their numbers were quickly replaced by a boom in the growing tourism industry. These changes put the rapidly aging pre-war liners at a major disadvantage. It was only a matter of time before a wave of new liners better suited for the changing market would emerge. Somewhat surprisingly, it was Germany who first introduced challengers for the Blue Band with Bremen and Europa. Large, fast, and radically modern, they set a new standard Passengers and competitors quickly took notice, and they were soon joined by Italy's wrecks. Britain and France were slower to introduce new generations of liners, but once Bremen captured the Blue Band away from the Mauritania, both countries responded to the challenge decisively, with liners that would eclipse both Bremen's speed and her size. While these ships were conceived during the feverish optimism of the 1920s, it's incredible that they were ever constructed once the Great Depression paralyzed both nations' economies. The plans that emerged for the French line's new 1,000-foot liner would be enormously expensive and the costs were prohibitive without government support. But funding an ultra-luxurious ocean liner that most French citizens wouldn't even be able to afford to sail on, while many of the country were starving and on unemployment, were obviously controversial. But at the same time, nationalism was on the rise all over Europe, and the majority opinion was that the French government had to fund such a program to maintain the upper hand over a rising Germany. So the ship was deemed a point of national prestige, and the Chamber of Deputies in Paris agreed on July 3rd, 1931, to grant a loan of 120 million francs to the French line, and a commitment to assist with further measures to ensure the line's long-term viability. Two further pieces of legislation made the French line a national corporation with combined public and private ownership, and established a new convention for calculating postal subsidies for the line. Finally, in 1933, the National Parliament passed measures to account for the line's building costs, interest payments, and taxes for the new ship, making her officially a national flagship of France. With a virtually unlimited budget, the French line had what they needed to build a liner that would be an awe-inspiring representation of the greatest art, culture, and design the French nation had to offer. It was a challenge they met with great enthusiasm. Normandy's builders recognized that if they were going to achieve 30 knots, they had to design a hull that would reduce drag as much as possible. Where Cunard bet everything on Mauritania's turbines, the French line would bet it all on hull design. This responsibility fell on an unlikely junior designer. Vladimir Yorkovich began his career designing battleships in Imperial Russia, but relocated to Paris after the revolution. He found work as a laborer at Renault, but eventually found his way back into naval architecture in the yards of Saint-Nazaire by 1928. Yorkovich's supervisors were impressed with his initial proposed hull designs and ordered models for testing at a facility near Versailles. But a backlog of naval orders and issues with the tank led to significant delays. After 16 months, Yorkovich and his staff finally relocated to Hamburg, Germany, where they carried out excessive testing on a 28-foot paraffin model. 
Only after the design was deemed unimprovable did Yorkovich report his final design. They yielded a slightly perplexing appearance out of water with a distressingly pear-shaped midship. This shape, though strange at the time, provided a reserve of buoyant displacement that permitted an astonishingly efficient bow, which utilized the same bulbous forefoot as Germany's Bremen. Any awkwardness disappeared when she took her rightful place in the water, where many of her contemporaries, such as the Queen Mary, would crash through the water with an enormous bow wave and massive wake, Normandy would glide effortlessly. It's hard not to be astonished when you compare the two, and Normandy's owners took great pride in pointing out the differences. Her exterior design accentuated the sense of power, grace, and speed. Her three oval-shaped funnels were given a 10-degree rake and diminished in height to give a sense of motion. Her paint scheme further accentuated her sleek lines with white banding that sharply tapered to a fine point at the tip of her prow. The giant white whaleback on her bow was as much functional as it was decorative, providing space to hide her winches, chains, and other machinery. The hidden deck machinery throughout the ship gave her wide open passenger decks that added to her clean, sweeping lines. Normandy's superstructure was also uniquely large for the time, extending along 71.5% of the ship's overall length. Every line was carefully curved to maintain an ultra-aerodynamic appearance. Powering the giant ship sufficiently to enable a 30-knot service speed was a challenge. Finally, a compromise was reached with turboelectric propulsion. The transfer of power from her steam turbines to her propellers was electrical rather than mechanical, which allowed more flexibility in the layout of her machinery. The new engine design offered a great deal of operational flexibility and allowed the ship to run efficiently at lower speeds when needed. She also had a large power reserve, with her engines rated to run at only 75% to reach her maximum 30 knot speed. Her power systems, however, were not perfect, and Normandy suffered vibration issues for all of her short career. These issues were initially so severe that passengers in cabins directly over her screws had to be moved to other cabins on the second night of her maiden voyage. Vibration issues were extremely common at the time, especially for ships competing for the Blue Ribbon but obviously the French line was eager to remedy the situation. During her first annual layup, many solutions were suggested and implemented. Strengthening elements were added throughout the ship, and her first-class terrace was replaced with a tourist-class lounge to increase her size and weight. Finally, it was suggested that the issue might stem from her propeller design, and a new set of four-bladed propellers were ordered to replace her previous three-bladed set. Upon testing at her full service speed, company officials were thrilled to find that these alterations greatly reduced the problem. The press was sent gleeful notices proclaiming that the issues had been solved. With the ship set to sail the following day, the captain soon received a confusing report from the chief engineer. A diver sent on a routine inspection of the hull reported that all three propellers were in good shape. This was an alarming report for a four-propeller ship. It was soon confirmed that her port central tail shaft was indeed missing its propeller. At some point during her triumphant vibration-free trial, they must have lost the propeller, likely just after the engines were stopped as the loss would almost definitely have been detected during operation. Without any replacement four bladed propellers available, Normandy was dry docked overnight and two of her original three bladed propellers were hastily installed. When she reached her service speed on the following day's voyage, her vibration issues were as bad as ever, confirming the suspicion that they stemmed from a flaw in her original propeller design. Those minor issues aside, the Normandy's hull and engine design were absolutely revolutionary and deeply impressive. Her innovative design allowed her, at 160,000 horsepower, to challenge what the Queen Mary could only achieve at 200,000 horsepower. But the marvels that Normandy are remembered for stretch well beyond her power and hull. Normandy was unprecedented in every way, and her first-class spaces were appointed with art, luxury, and an attention to detail that will likely never be rivaled. Like only a small handful of ships before her, Normandy's boiler uptakes were divided, allowing large passenger spaces that flowed uninterrupted from one end of the ship to the other. Apparently, if you knelt on the stage of her theater, you would have an uninterrupted view all the way through her rear windows, nearly 500 feet away. 
Speaking of her theater, Normandy was the first ship to ever boast a full proper theater that could accommodate both live performances and movie screenings. It's hard to overstate the opulence of her public spaces. They were aggressively elegant with nearly every surface covered in gold, glass, marble, fine woods, and works of art. Her decor was themed to represent the Normandy region of France and her designs were a classic interpretation of Art Deco, an exuberant style popular in the 1920s and 30s that combined modern styles with fine craftsmanship and high-end materials. The movement borrowed the bold geometric forms of cubism, the bright colors of fauvism, and was heavily influenced by styles from China, Japan, India, Persia, ancient Egypt, and Mayan art. Her grand salle à manger was three decks high. Not just a small well or balcony like on other liners, the entire room occupied the full height. It featured absolutely massive 20-foot lighting fixtures, glass walls, and a coffered gilt ceiling. The room was designed to recede dramatically into a shimmering light hundreds of yards away. It was an absolutely breathtaking room of light and glass that surpassed anything built before or since. The French Line's publicists love pointing out that the room was larger than the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Every single first-class cabin was decorated differently with over 400 completely separate design schemes. You could sail on the ship hundreds of times without staying in a cabin that looked the same as your last voyage, something that's almost completely unthinkable today. I could go on and on about her winter garden with live plants and birds, her massive embarkation hall, her air conditioning, the one-of-a-kind sculptures, paintings, and bronze work, but this video would be several hours long. Suffice to say, traveling on the Normandy was undoubtedly an unrivaled experience. Every detail was thought out to make sure that from port to port you were bathed in luxury. Except for those who wound up in one of those vibration cabins in the rear. Unless you're into that. Normandy was constructed in Saint-Nazaire with the designation T6. Many names were considered, including Dumais and Le Belfance, until they decided on Normandy. She was launched on October 29, 1932, to great fanfare and nerves, as she was by far the largest object ever transported from land to sea up until that point. The wave produced when she hit the Loire River swept several spectators away, but thankfully no one was injured. She was christened by Madame Marguerite Lebrun, the wife of Albert Lebrun, the president of France at that time. Her fitting out process lasted three years, and during her trials, she reached a top speed of 32.125 knots. Upon her completion, she was 79,280 tons, 1,029 feet long, 184 feet in height, and had a beam of 117 feet. A year later, she would be modified to be 83,423 tons. She could accommodate 1,972 passengers and 1,345 crew. She left Le Havre on her maiden voyage on May 29, 1935. Four days, three hours, and two minutes later, she reached New York and claimed the Blue Riband. She sailed into New York Harbor flying a brilliant 30-foot blue pennant, and passengers were presented with commemorative medallions. It's estimated that over 100,000 spectators watched her arrive in New York, and the liner was instantly a household name. The Cunard's Queen Mary, a ship roughly equivalent in size and speed, was nearing completion and would sail her maiden voyage the following year. Their famous rivalry would define both ships' careers. Normandy was neither a breakout success or the abject failure some make her out to be. Her first year of service was her most successful, but once the Queen Mary entered service, Normandy saw a drop in popularity. This was for a few reasons, the biggest being that Normandy was a first-class ship not particularly well suited to the current market. She was an ultra-glamorous ship at a time when ostentatious displays of wealth were falling out of fashion. While her second and tourist-class accommodations were tasteful and comfortable, they were small and largely an afterthought. At the same time, Queen Mary's builders took note of the growing popularity of tourism and recognized that this new market appreciated accommodations that didn't feel like the bare-bones third class found on older ships. They devoted just as much care and space to the new tourist class as they devoted to their first class spaces, and the general public took note. But the Queen Mary wasn't Normandy's only competition. Cunard White Stars, Britannic, Georgic, and even the older Aquitania were popular and offered less class-conscious experiences for passengers looking for a more relaxed and affordable crossing. 
One of the biggest downsides of sailing on the Normandy were paradoxically the appointments that made her so impressively grand. Many passengers felt that she was just too much, oppressively formal, uncomfortably opulent, like spending four days living in a fine art museum. It's impressive to walk through, but not necessarily to live in. The Queen Mary, on the other hand, was less grand, more homely, and more approachable. She carried over the styles and traditions many passengers were familiar with older vessels, and while she was certainly luxurious and grand, her general atmosphere was more relaxed and comfortable. All of this made Normandy less popular among the general public and gave her an intimidating reputation as a ship exclusively for the ultra-rich, and she often sailed only half full. Normandy was not exactly the financial disaster she sometimes made out to be. She never required government subsidies while in service, earning enough to cover her operating costs and generating 158 million francs in revenue. While she didn't recover her building costs, she was only in service for four years and never had a career long enough to recoup those expenses. Normandy's short career was somewhat routine, but she does belong to that exclusive club of ships that in peacetime somehow managed to crash into a plane when in 1936, an RAF torpedo bomber, while flying a drill, attempted to buzz the liner, but flew too close and got caught in her crane lines. The pilot was uninjured, but the plane was stuck with the Normandy until it could be removed in Le Havre. Despite Normandy's middling success, the French line began planning a running mate. She was to be named the SS Bretagne. Details are sketchy, but the ship was to be at least 85,000 tons, with some plans putting her at over 100,000 tons. It's also claimed that her intended speed would exceed an astonishing 35 knots. Two main design schemes were put forward. One, designed by Vladimir Yorkovich, sported an ultra-modern parallel funnel design, but the French line opted for the more conservative plan that largely followed the Normandy with just two funnels, not unlike Cunard's plans for Queen Elizabeth. But the outset of World War II shelved these plans and put a swift end to Normandy's brief but spectacular career. By late summer 1939, with tensions building in Europe, Normandy sought the safety of New York Harbor and was docked at Pier 88. On the 3rd of September 1939, the day France declared war on Germany, she was interned by the U.S. government though she remained in French hands and kept her French crew until the spring of 1940. She was soon joined by Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, and for five months the three largest liners in the world would sit idle. On May 15, 1940, the United States Coast Guard issued 150 agents to protect the ship from sabotage. These agents remained in a supervisory role until the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor and officially drawn into the war. On December 12, 1941, the Normandy was officially seized under the right of Angary, her French crews were relieved, and the Coast Guard took over maintenance of the ship. They took up several key duties, including maintaining steam in her boilers, but they inexplicably abandoned maintaining her elaborate fire control systems. I'm sure that tidbit won't come back later. She was renamed the USS Lafayette on December 31, 1941. A few plans were considered for the massive liner. There was even a proposal to turn her into an aircraft carrier, but they of course moved forward with the most logical option to convert her to a troop ship. A delay for her scheduled first sailing date was requested to give crews more time to plan and execute the complicated conversions, but these requests were ultimately denied. This gave crews less than two months to complete the complicated project. It would have been one of the more impressive engineering feats of the war if they managed to pull it off, but of course, they didn't. Crews were completely unfamiliar with the complicated ship, and the panic time frame led to a complete breakdown in supervision, judgment, and common sense. On the morning of February 9, 1942, the feverish work of removing Normandy's luxurious fittings was well underway in her vast public rooms, which featured mechanical firewalls that could divide spaces and contain fires in an emergency. These were, of course, disabled, and even if they were operational, they were blocked with massive piles of flammable material, including thousands of life jackets that were filled with capic, a great material for flotation that also happened to be highly flammable, because why not? Crews were in the process of removing the four giant light fixtures from her lounge. These fixtures sat on metal tripods that had to be cut with a torch. They removed three, but the last was surrounded by piles of flammable life jackets. They removed just enough to access the metal legs and began cutting. This process used an asbestos shield to contain sparks, but as the crew made cuts on the final leg, 
the shield was prematurely removed, and sparks quickly ignited the piles of flammable life jackets all around them. Contrary to regulations, there were no fire extinguishers nearby, no fire hoses on hand, and no fire watcher. They just had two buckets of water. Fire spread quickly, and crews broke into absolute chaos. A worker running to bring the two buckets of water tripped and fell, spilling the water well short of the flames. Another worker ran to the promenade to fetch a fire hose, but they only got about a gallon of water from its nozzle before pressure dropped to nothing. Remember that whole disabling the fire control system thing? The New York City Fire Department responded to the call 12 minutes later. The first fireboat on the scene was the James Duane. By the time she arrived, the ship was completely overtaken with smoke, forcing all crews to evacuate. Her furnaces were shut down, leaving the ship without power to light her interiors or power any water pumps. There were 3,000 men on board when the fire broke out and the evacuation was complete chaos, with hundreds forced to make their way through the blacked out, smoke-filled passageways of the ship many of them were completely unfamiliar with. Incredibly, only 200 were injured and there was only one fatality, Frank Trentacosta, a 36-year-old Brooklyn resident who was part of the fire watch. Without any other options and facing winds that helped spread the blaze throughout the ship, crews simply pumped as much water as they could on the blaze and the ship began lifting dangerously to port. Vladimir Yorkovich, Normandy's designer, was actually in New York City at the time and rushed to help. He knew the ship better than anyone, but he was barred from the scene by police. He urged them to open her seacocks and allow the ship to settle in the shallow water, but he was ignored because this was a Navy job. Top heavy with thousands of gallons of water, the ship eventually capsized early the next morning. Press was barred from the scene by the Navy, who knew the incompetence of the whole ordeal was not a great look for them. But the morning light revealed the extent of the damage. The Lafayette was a total loss, and the wreck would remain at Pier 88 for nearly two years until she was finally righted. Fitting the Normandy, the salvage was the largest and most complex at the time, costing an estimated $5 million. She was finally cut up in New Jersey between 1946 and 1948. I think John Maxstone Graham, author of The Only Way to Cross, summed her up best. In short, the Normandy was unrealistic, impractical, uneconomical, and magnificent. Circumstance helped make Normandy a mythical ship. She only completed four seasons. While millions sailed on Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, very few people actually got to experience what it was like to sail on the Normandy. She never grew old. Like a celebrity that died young, all we have are images of Normandy in her prime. Would she have rivaled Cunard's queens after the war? Would she become a hotel somewhere in France or abroad? We'll never know, and that's what makes her magical. People in general know the Queen Mary as that old ship in Long Beach. They know the Titanic for being, well, Titanic. But if you ask the average person about Normandy, they'll say it's a place or a famous battle. But if you ask an enthusiast about Normandy, they will smile and say, she was the greatest ocean liner of all time. But was she really that great? Yeah, I think so. From my perspective, all of these ships are just an idea. I'll never sail on the Mauritania, or the Titanic, the Bremen, or the Normandy. Queen Mary is the only survivor, and unfortunately, in her current state, she's far from her service time glory. These ships live on now, only in our imagination. And imagining the splendor of Normandy is like imagining a beautiful dream.